have uh, there are a couple of presentations that we're going to make. Uh, I'm going to set the tone by uh, a set of introductory comments about the market, and uh, then Soumya is going to share her quick perspectives on on the industry, and then we shall go through a set of questions with the panel that we have here. I'll initiate a few questions, and I would request all of you to also kind of prepare yourself and pose some intriguing questions to this interesting panel. So let's get started with the, with the context. Uh, people ask me this question whenever I stand up to present, people expect that I'll present some new numbers. I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to present any new numbers because uh, fundamentally a lot has not changed about the market uh, at the macro level. There are a few mac big changes that we'll talk about, but otherwise it's it's a little bit more of the same, uh, but uh, we've gone a little deeper into uh, to find out what's really changed at the operating level. <clears throat> so the market is will be around 15 billion, growing it broadly 20%. Uh, products, which is the more visible part of the market, uh, and assets, where you see a lot many luxury cars on the roads that you saw uh, several years ago, those are clearly driving the growth. Services has been a little patchy. Uh, there is enough latent demand in the market. So the more stores you open, the more consumers you reach, and the more more the market grows. So a lot of growth actually comes from new store opening, not necessarily from same store sales growth. There are enough rich people in the market. Uh, there is awareness and exposure, and there is what is called as a Gini coefficient, which is an indicator of the inequality of income distribution. So when we say that the GDP per capita grows by 6%, uh, does every person become 6% richer every year? Uh, no, some become more richer than others. So India is an unequal market. So that inequality coefficient is increasing a little bit, uh, not a whole lot, and that does contribute uh, in from a so social point of view, it's probably not as desirable, but when it comes to luxury spending, you have more money in the hands of rich people, they'll spend it more. Uh, I guess you had a, just had a session on uh, e-retail, and that's becoming an interesting option for people as well. Uh, look at it whichever way. There is a huge market beyond the metros. So if you look at total retail market potential value, 60% of the value lies in the tier two, tier three uh, cities. And we've, we've I've spoken earlier about what's the market for luxury products as well. <clears throat> Just to give you a quick snapshot of what has happened in the last one year, about 50 more luxury outlets have got added. So you see about 32 luxury product stores got added, and about 18 luxury car showrooms got added. Out of the 32, and you know, three brands entered and one brand exited, so probably net net a couple of brands uh, got added. Uh, Mumbai and Delhi continue to lead the pack in terms of luxury store additions, so 12 and 11 respectively, and nine stores beyond beyond Mumbai and Delhi. The luxury car showrooms actually show you a very interesting perspective. Um, 15 out of 18 showrooms got added in cities beyond uh, Mumbai and Delhi. Uh, and if you look at the quantum of uh, purchase that a luxury car represents, you can buy many more handbags at the price of one luxury car. So it does tell you that there is a lot more uh, wealth in the hinterland than we choose to acknowledge. <clears throat> so Pune, Surat, Ludhiana are some of your uh, interesting cities. The base has been small, uh, and therefore most product and car companies have grown in high double digits. The numbers that you see here are not revenues of the companies, they are an index. So if you took 2010 as the index, uh, there's an example of the, an Indian luxury fashion house, uh, which has grown at 34% in the last three years. Uh, a major Indian luxury hotel grown at 15%. Uh, and luxury car brand growing at 30%. And I think the car growth is true for almost all brands, Mercedes, Audi, BMW, all of them have more or less grown at this rate. Uh, we also spoke to, spoke to some uh, industry CEOs, just to get a sense of how has the downturn impacted them, and, and I presume that's a question on your mind, which we should ask the panel as well. Uh, globally, luxury is somewhat immune to a downturn, simply because the luxury products do form a very small percentage of uh, a wealthy person's spend. So it doesn't really matter whether you buy one extra suit or one extra watch when you're a billionaire. Uh, and in India also, the downturn does not seem to have had a major impact on the market. People have become more cautious, but it's not as if the growth rate has dramatically slowed down. But yes, high import duties continue to be an issue. 
The rupee devaluation means that an imported product becomes 20% more expensive than what it was a year ago. So that does, does pose a challenge. <clears throat> in services, uh, fine dining has been small, but there are interesting, a lot of interesting restaurants coming up. Uh, luxury hotel rooms has been a little stunted. Uh, global demand slowdown and overseas visitors traveling to India does have an impact on them. Uh, and interest rates, therefore, kind of put a, put a little bit of wet blanket on how many rooms they want to add. Uh, luxury cars seem to be uh, have grown well, but the high interest rates and if there is a slower demand growth, they would worry about it. Real estate has has actually suffered, uh, and real estate, uh, the luxury homes sales have actually stagnated a little bit. What has also happened is that uh, the Indian plain luxury is now uh, now twofold. You can see two different patterns emerging in the market clearly. So there are at least three groups, and there could be a fourth, I think, uh, but broadly two, three groups which have uh, become ag aggregators of brands, so to say. And international brands are now kind of talking to these people, and each of them have built a decent portfolio of uh, brands, which allows them to kind of share their overheads, share media expenses, uh, share management bandwidth, uh, get better deals with real estate firms. So these are kind of emerging as... Uh, luxury houses, so to say. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, there are enough Indian luxury brands that you see. Uh, hotels has always been there, uh, but you have in apparel, there are enough designers that you have, um, and there are enough jewelry brands. So uh, there is a small but clear Indian luxury play that is emerging uh, in this market. Some of it was also helped by the fact that uh, till now, FDI, uh, there was a constraint on that. So companies had to tie up with somebody and therefore that made it, it actually helped some of these companies. Some of the Indian brands, what one can take away from them, uh, all of them have, it's not the, that they've had it easy, uh, patience and persistence has actually paid off. If you speak to any one of them, uh, they will tell you that there is hope in the market but you need to be patient, stay invested. Uh, all of them have also found that focus on the product quality and experience actually helps immensely and so does building consumer awareness. Uh, in terms of the challenges that the market has faced, there were five big challenges. FDI, reaching the consumer, duties, real estate and talent. Uh, the four, on the remaining four, nothing much has been done. So things remain as it is. From the time I first uh, studied the luxury market in 2007, nothing has moved on, on those. On the first one, a little bit has moved, uh, which is that you now they've taken away the uh, restriction on uh, foreign direct investment, but there's a local sourcing clause which, which has, I think, mixed reactions. On one hand, uh, people feel that, you know, is there really a good quality product that we can actually source? There is no doubt that raw material has been sourced from India for several years. Uh, so Christian Lobota, I think once in one of these forums, he said that he used to come to India specifically to source embroidered cloth. Uh, and there are enough people who source leather and, and kind of stuff. So raw materials have been sourced. Whether they'll source finished products from the country uh, remains to be seen. Whether it will be 30% remains to be seen. But if it does, uh, it will also serve as a fillip to the... Indian luxury brands, uh, when you have that kind of products and art artisanship uh, being demonstrated, it helps building an Indian brand if you have to. Uh, rest, I, I would say micro segmentation is still nascent. Uh, people are still going after the same old uh, bunch of consumers that they know, uh, trying to convert the new consumer, the consumer who has the money but doesn't have the mindset to buy. Uh, I think a lot less has been done than what could have been done. Uh, duties continue, real estate, we still don't have uh, enough spaces, so a new brand wanting to open stores, uh, they don't really have too many options, and the options that they have do tend, turn out to be expensive. And talent, it is an issue. Um, we've been asked this question several times, saying that can India develop luxury brands, and I'll give you some examples of brands that are already uh, what can be called, called luxury in India. But if you look at uh, China, uh, there are at least uh, many luxury brands which are what one can call as true luxury uh, are emerging there. There's Shangzia, which is a furniture apparel brand. There's uh, Tiger Fashion. There's Wines, Wines and Spirits brand. Uh, each of them are kind of rooted in ethnic Chinese uh, uh, heritage and legacy. Uh, many of them have, have had some interest from um, LVMH or Hermes or some of those. They do a lot of customization and their products are pretty appealing to the uh, Chinese population, and they do have a part of their, uh, what I would say, portfolio, which is really, really high-end. So uh, products should suit local tastes. That's where a luxury brand, a domestic luxury brand can succeed. You have to make sure that it is clear. I mean, if you want to make it exclusive, that don't compromise uh, on that. Uh, you will grow slowly, but at least you will maintain your positioning. 
and finally focus on customer experience. <coughs> uh, what does one need to do to succeed in the Indian market? I think uh, some of this might not be new to you, but believe in the market. Uh, you can you can say, well, since I'm not seeing money now, what other option do I have? But to believe in the long term. Uh, but yes, patience and persistence does pay. Uh, so believe in the market. There is the fundamentals are. The fundamentals cannot go wrong. Eventually, people will spend money. Uh, the question is, as and when it, uh, the product appeals to the customer, as and when the price is right, as and when the experience is right, I think people will definitely spend. There is enough latent demand, I think, as several studies have shown that. Enhancing the penetration. I mean, going close to the consumer, I think there is, there is no option. Uh, it is a slightly unaware consumer. You have to take the brand close to the consumer. Let the consumer come in, experience the brand, experience. Let them understand why a luxury brand charges so much. Uh, a luxury brand is not something which you know sells something at a high price. If 90% of the price is still material cost, it's not a luxury brand. A luxury brand is where something with the brand premium is significantly high. So there are a whole host of Indian jewelers who sell really high price pieces, but they're not all luxury brands. So targeting new catchments in tier one towns, uh, uh, we have to move beyond South Bombay and South Delhi. There is a lot of wealth beyond these catchments in the tier one towns. And we have to go to tier two cities uh, as well. And uh, we strongly believe that recruiting new customers who have the money but not the mindset is actually, they're going to be your future customers of tomorrow. Customization uh, and education and getting people to experience the brand is, is, is good. Uh, from that point of view, the sales, many luxury brands have gone on sale and many people have heard saying, well, these brands seem to be selling only when there is a sale. It's not bad because somebody who buys a product at a 50% discount today uh, gets to experience the product. Uh, he gets to show it off and people recognize the value. And then when he, when he or she has more money, they will buy it at full price. One day they'll buy it at 70% uh, price and then one day at full, at full prices. And finally, it is still a... Uh, a business where your economics can go horribly wrong if you are not frugal, if you're not careful, uh, if your overheads tend to overshadow uh, the business, if the shape of your P&L is not right, you can, uh, you can be dead. So therefore, any kind of innovations on sharing costs and overheads will be very welcome. I'm going to raise a few questions for the panel. Uh, is the luxury market and sub-segments, if any, immune to the slowdown? Do you see the FDI deregulation as a big boost to the industry? Is local sourcing a big constraint? And finally, tapping luxury, luxury consumers, what has worked, what hasn't. But before we do that, Soumya, can I invite you to make your presentation? Thank you. Uh, I'm Soumya from Luxury Fact. There might be some overlaps between uh, mine and Leish's uh, presentations, but I'll move through it quickly. Um, I'm going to just explain a few reasons why luxury, what, what makes luxury brands tick and what doesn't. Um, just a quick glimpse, although he has already given the numbers, but still. Indian luxury market projected to reach USD 14.72 billion in 2015. Market growth rate is over 20% per annum, which is very positive for everybody in the industry. India has 7,730 ultra high net worth individuals, of which 109 are billionaires. But despite so much of money, brands are still not able to make inroads as much as is expected in India. Potential reasons of exit, first is mismatch of partners. Joint ventures, franchisee models sometimes fail because brands are not able to get the correct partner who understands their product value, who understands their customer service. One example is Degh Rizogano, a jewelry and watch brand which came to India and very quickly exited the market. Another example is Murjani Group. It had Jimmy Choo, Gucci and a few other brands in its fold. But it exited the luxury business completely and focused more on the mid-range budget brands. Mr. Murjani says imbalance between franchises and franchises is one of the biggest challenges for luxury retail in India. Second reason, which is probably the biggest reason, is lack of luxury retail space, high import duties, and Indians buying abroad. DL of Brands is the latest example, which has again exited the luxury business. For them, size with speed was important and despite being there in the for in the market for two three years they had only four ferragamo stores and three armani stores which is very less as compared to a global average another example is alfred dunhill which again recently exit the market uh, they haven't uh, finished their partnership with the uh, brand house retail yet but 
they have exited the market because it did not suit them. Where brands might fail is long gestation periods and need of massive investment. Versace recently ended partnership with Blue's clothing company. What clicks with the Indian market? There are a lot of factors where luxury brands can score, uh, can score and probably uh, try to tap the luxury consumer. The first one is having an Indian connection. It's it's pretty famous. The Kanal, the Kanali Nawab jacket, the Bottega Veneta, not large. They're pretty famous now, and they have really captured the market with these Indian-specific products. Another example is leveraging Indian events, especially weddings. Moet Hennessy, they have uh, they have a special chef who makes uh, who makes special uh, menus depending on which champagne a client orders for their weddings. So. Maybe facilities like this can really uh, make a brand click in India. Jimmy Choo took out special golden shoes only for Indian weddings. Second is communicate with aspirational consumers because as Nilesh said, you have to go above, over and above the set target of consumers you have. One example is Burberry, which uh, really uh, harnesses the digital medium to reach a larger base of consumers who may not be current, but they might be potential consumers for them. Another example is Remy Martin. It did not, uh, it created a specific product, a new product for the younger audience. The Remy Martin VSOP, which is a cognac, they gave it in a younger format with chilled ice shots and put it in all upmarket F&B areas. So that might appeal to a younger audience more who might graduate to taking the original cognac in the future. Give a complete experience. Like Nilesh said that various stages of giving an experience to a consumer. One, of, one example is Harley Davidson, who even after sales has formed this group called Hane, uh, Harley uh, Owners Group, where all the owners come together, they do events, they have rides. Another is Harley Rock Riders, where they call music bands and have, have cultural events together. So that forms a whole loyalty around the brand. Another example is Keels. They have a very good training uh, for their for their representatives at stores. They probably, they, uh, they give them proper training on how to talk about uh, the brand, how to give samples, how to treat customers who come in for a first time experience. And in fact, they, they have four stores in India already and they're gonna have, they're going to have six by the end of this year with, and they have been in the market for two years only. So that's a pretty good average as compared to what a lot of lux other luxury brands are faring. Fourth uh, thing, which a fourth factor which can help brands in India is how to create different strategies for different areas. India is not one country. India is a collection of a lot of mini countries. A Mumbai consumer will behave differently as compared to a Delhi consumer. So Mont Blanc, they do, when, they, when they give out invitations to their consumers, they send separate kind of invitations to, the, to their uh, consumers in North, which are more lavish, more ostentious, as compared to the ones which they send in South. Weave a story around the brand. Because since brands, since luxury brands are kind of an emotional purchase, you have to weave a story around them, present them in a beautiful way. Like Louis Vuitton and even Cartier do by talking about their whole relationship with Maharajas. Sixth is, like, like I said, luxury brands are mostly an emotional purchase. But in India, you have to justify them rationally as well. You have to tell why they are a good purchase and why they are demanding such a high price for it. So watch brands like A. Langia and Son. They don't only talk about how good their watch is, they also talk about how they make the watch and what makes it sell at such a high price. You have to justify the cost to the Indian consumer. In conclusion, it is important to understand the Indian market, but even more important to have understanding between the partners. Because if you don't have an understanding between the partners, everything might fail. India is a unique market. You can't compare it with China or any other market globally, in fact. A cut, copy, paste will not work over here. India does not have one formula. Each brand has to make their own strategy for this market. Understand and accept India's myriad paradoxes. India has a lot of paradoxes, whether it comes, whether it's in their uh, retail strategy, whether it's in terms of consumers, whether it's in terms of taste. There are a lot of paradoxes which brands have to keep in mind. So be prepared and open to experimentation. You have Manishi, who's, uh, who was with uh, the LVMH watch and jewelry business for a long time, and now he heads up uh, uh, DFS. Uh, Abhay, who's uh, been in this business for uh, a significant period of time, and now he's uh, taken on the challenge of talent, uh, which is indeed a big challenge, as we spoke about. 
Then you have Pradeep, who's been in this business again for a very long time and uh, has made Kimaya a brand uh, to reckon with. And I'm going to talk, ask him, going to ask him to talk about some of his experiences. Um, Swarovski is a very, very interesting story, and we have Sukanya here uh, to talk about how they compete with uh, a very traditionally jewelry mindset that that India has. And, and Somia, we'll ask her a few questions about uh, media and luxury. So let me start with uh, uh, Manishi. Uh, we Indians do spend a lot of money abroad. In fact, every brand that you speak to, they will say that Indians are a big uh, consumer segment. Uh, what is there anything we can do to bring that spend back inside India? And if that's not possible, at least to DFS in India. Okay. Uh, I mean, yes, Nilesh is right that uh, most of the brands do crib that a lot of spend uh, happens outside India. Uh, so in that in that context, uh, uh, an airport retail seems to be a very interesting uh, interesting positioning. Uh, the only I mean there are two things, and uh, it all connects with the emotional part of purchase, which Indians uh, do involve me. And I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm uh, probably covering the domestic uh, retail in airports as well as the duty free retail in airports. Uh, one of them is that a substantial part of Indians. Uh, if you look at the data around, uh, roughly, you know, only about 5% of Indians travel more than once or more than twice to international destinations. Uh, for the rest, 95% of people, they do probably once a, once a year uh, or probably once in two to three years kind of a travel. Uh, now, for that substantial lot, uh, to know that there is a quality retail which is available in airports uh, takes time. It, it, it will happen, but it will happen over time. It cannot happen overnight uh, because the first time when this guy is traveling outside, he has heard about stories about shopping in Singapore or in Orchard Road, uh, but he's not mentally prepared that there is an airport which is present and therefore there is a retail. Uh, so that's the first part of the problem that uh, international spends will come in, uh, but the first, uh, the airports have to improve. So there are new airports which are coming up. Uh, but after that, it will take, take time. It will take two, three, four years till people are well aware that there are airports and there are retail stores which are comparable in the airport context. The second one is on domestic retail. A lot of discussion does happen that can domestic retail uh, happen on domestic flights. Uh, and a lot of observation which we have is that, uh, again, for most of the Indians, uh, uh, shopping is a family experience. So there has to be, you know, if you are buying a shirt, especially if it is a high-end shirt, uh, you, you need uh, a validation from your family, be it wife, son, daughter, whoever. Uh, now that proposition falls apart on a domestic travel. Uh, most of the domestic travelers are business travelers who are traveling on their own. Uh, and therefore those categories which are probably gift driven uh, or not so much related to personal likings and dislikes, uh, those kind of categories will fly, but uh, whether a luxury shirt or a bag or a luxury fashion brand can operate in a domestic environment, it, it will take time. I think the, the biggest single luxury purchase that happens in a duty-free environment would be Johnny Walker Black Label. Is that right? <laughs> now, that, that should be easier. I, I've seen people lug, you know, bags of uh, Johnny Walker Black Label from one airport to the other airport and they get it in India. When it is so much easier, you just buy it here and you can even pay while you go. So, <clears throat> yeah, you're right. There's probably a lot more awareness uh, in that required. But we, we look forward to that day when, I guess, uh, the price points are pretty competitive. Is that right? The price points are competitive, but again, I mean, unless you try, you travel three times, you will not get convinced about the fact that the price points are competitive. Uh, so the first time buyers are more comfortable buying, buying abroad. Uh, I think the first is quality of infrastructure has to improve, which is improving. Uh, Bombay, you all will see a very state of the art new terminal, which is coming up in another one year's time. So that part is being taken care of. The second one is a matter of time. I mean, within two to three trips, you will understand. Uh, that the value proposition is better in, uh, in in India and you will shift your purchase. So it will happen, it's just a matter of time. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's good to hear and I think it's become a sizable business now. Um, it'll, it'll, I guess it'll be one of the largest luxury businesses in the country uh, soon if not already. Uh, uh, Pradeep, I had a question for you. You've been in this business and you've made some very interesting experiments in uh, what I would say recruiting the consumer at the next level, you know, there's people who buy the, as, as Pradeep says, 22,000 rupees is the average price of a designer dress, but there are a whole host of consumers who don't want to spend that much money, but uh, how can we recruit them? So Pradeep has done some interesting experiments uh, in that area. Would you like to talk about some of that? 
launched Kimaya in the metros. I mean, India, some years back, had just two cities, Bombay, Delhi. Suddenly, right now, you have more than 40 cities coming up. You, and, and that's where the real acceleration is going. But are they, are they ready for Kimaya? Are they ready for absolutely high end right now? We, f we found a gap. And to address that, we, we commissioned an agency to do a survey for us, to do a study for us. And they found that the, today, the most powerful consumer in this country, the woman, what are our options where Indian wear is concerned? We also found out that Indian wear constitutes of 72.3% of her wardrobe in value terms. And where is she buying? Where is she spending that money? So there are a couple of brands, national brands, who are, uh, who are there. I can't name it on this forum, but yeah, the average MRP of those uh, brands, women's wear brands, was around 1,250 rupees. And beyond that, if she wanted to spend more than that, because the man in her life spends 2,000 on his shirt and 2,000 on his trouser, he spends four, 5,000 on his look. If she wants to spend more than 1,250, then she had to buy designer wear, which is available only in the metros, and which the average price was 22,700 rupees. So we found a huge vacuum between 1,250 and 22,000. So either you buy the Maruti 800 or you buy the Phantom, there's nothing in between. To address this, we launched a brand called Karmic. Uh, Karmic is based on three principles, aspirational, affordable, and accessible, the three aces. Today, uh, what does a woman aspire for in terms of clothing? What is the highest that she can aspire for? Is designer wear? She wants designer wear? Is she willing to pay 22,000? Maybe not yet, maybe eventually. What is she willing to pay? What is a, what is a sweet spot for her? The sweet spot was arrived at $100. If we can give her designer wear in $100 in her city, it's a no-brainer. That's, that's what, with that in mind, we launched Karmic a couple of months back. We launched six stores in one week, and uh, that's it. So we, we've tied up with uh, 12 of India's top designers, uh, the Rohit Bals, the Anamika Khannas, the JJ Valayas, the Ritu Berries of, of India, uh, to do a complete ensemble for $100. Fantastic. I have a follow-up question for you. It is said that the Indian luxury market, a big part of the product spend, is on account of weddings. And that market is said to be immune to all kinds of recession simply because it has got no bearing with current cash flows. You either save for a marriage in a family or you borrow for a marriage in a family. Either way, it doesn't matter what you're earning today. Is that true? Hundred percent. It's the most important day in a woman's or a man's life. You look forward to or look back to it and, and, and you I mean people abroad say for funerals, here people say for weddings. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll move quickly to Sukanya, uh, and Sukanya, Swarovski is a very interesting brand. Uh, think of it as gifts, think of it as accessories, but think of it as also as jewelry. Uh, and it's a, it's a brilliant story of uh, how you can create a very, very aspirational uh, brand. Uh, Sukanya, what's been your experience, what's been the brand's experience in India? And, and I'm asking this question from a, an objective of a multinational which looks at India as only one of the markets for them. Uh, and again, it's a pretty peculiar market where, you know, people buy jewelry uh, and they spend lots of money on jewelry, but uh, anything which does not contain a precious metal uh, or a diamond, they are kind, they want to, want to buy it in terms of weight. So how do you look at this market and what's been uh, Swarovski's experience in this market? When we came into India, Swarovski was fortunate in already having a brand value or a brand following within the country. So when we launched our retail operations, the thing we decided is that what we will not compete with or compete in the category is fine jewelry. We were not selling jewelry. We were selling crystals. We were selling sparkle we were adding sparkle to people's life. And we were very clear in that in all our communication, in the way we planned our product range. So we created a niche category really for Swarovski in which we said we are fashion jewelry brand. We add uh, sparkle to your everyday life and that is our core category in which we spent time, about 12 years, to create that specific category where we are almost now the sole fas global fashion accessory player. Um, and we were very true to the brand. What you said, Nilesh, uh, in your opening thing, that emotional uh, 
attachment to a brand is very important in a market like India. And Swarovski being over a 117-year-old brand, we understood that fact. So we came into the market, we had consistency in the way we put across our products to make sure we create that emotional content. We took it across our various uh, product categories, whether it is with the working with the designers in their products, putting Swarovski in their products, or our very famous Crystal World. The common communication across was able to create within the emotional mind space of the consumers of Crystal as a generic word as Swarovski. And that has taken time. That has taken time, a conscious effort to do that. And that is what has been, I think, the fundamental of our success in the market. So we never really competed with the fine jewelry gold because we do not believe that we are catering to that same demand from the consumer. We are catering to a completely different uh, trigger of purchase, which is that I need to look good. I need to look good in an everyday life. In my everyday wardrobe, there should be something which adds that wow factor. Uh, you know, I have a pair of Swarovski cufflinks. It's a nice yellow colored crystal, in a, and I wear them, and I, I quite like them. Do you think Indians are moving towards that stage where they are willing to look at a product as, as an item of beauty and not necessarily in terms of the intrinsic you know, value of the precious metal or the stone that is in there? Definitely. I think as Indians, we are really evolving. We are discovering our style. We have a large uh, percentage of working women who have their own money, their own income. And uh, we want to be what we are. We are very Western now in a way we are moving out. And we will adopt practices which make us feel good. We are also very particular to do it in a way which is Indian. But uh, definitely, I think we are there that we want to indulge and spend on ourselves to give ourselves a personality defined by what we are sporting on our bodies. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'll turn to Somya now, and I have a question for her since you run a luxury a focused magazine. Uh, magazines do play a very important role in promoting awareness uh, of brands, and elsewhere you'll see that uh, the women who spend money on luxury products, they also spend equal amount of money on, or not equal amount of money, but they, they do spend money on buying magazines like, uh, you know, uh, L'Officiel and, you know, uh, where we tell them about the latest fashion trends and what to buy and how to spend their money. Uh, what's been the experience in India? Is, are these magazines really making a difference to the luxury awareness? Absolutely, because um, they, if, if we talk about the customer journey framework today, there are four, four broad cat, um, steps to it. First is awareness, like you said. Second is exploring a brand. Third is actually making the purchase. And fourth is having a post-sale relationship. The first two stages is where the media really helps. Awareness and actually, may, may, uh, actually exploring the brand and considering it and figuring it out if it's really worth your money. So yes, magazines are making a difference. Magazines like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar have become so popular. It's, it's like a household name. It is like a, a Bible. Of, it's like a fashion Bible today. So yes, media is very important. And they are making a difference. That, that's good to know. Um, and I used to have this uh, ongoing conversation with people in the jewelry industry earlier, where a lot of them used to advertise in trade magazines. And I would ask them, you know, who, so who really reads this magazine? So one diamond ad advertising in a diamond magazine, which is read by another diamond ad. It's, it's really a very incestuous circle, really not reaching the consumer who should be buying. Uh, but thereafter, things have changed. If you open uh, a Femina today, it will be full of advertisements from uh, diamond and jewelry companies. So likewise, uh, do you think these magazines are really reaching a consumer who's not aware, and are they playing a role in converting them? Because many of these magazines tend to be expensive. They tend to be distributed in places where only the people who's, who already know about them are likely to get them. Are they crossing the barrier of going beyond their zone of comfort? Some of them are, but I think this is where online media really helps because even if magazines are, a print magazine is not reaching them, online portals, online magazines, social media, this, these are the, these are, uh, medias which are reaching across the borders. So people need, brands need to target these media immensely and which they are not, honestly. Okay, I'll come back to this question because I do have a question on, on uh, online purchases and is it really more hype uh, than, than business? Uh, but I'll come back to that uh, for a moment, so hold on to that. But before that, I, I wanted to uh, ask Abhay uh, about the challenge that he's taken on head on to get more professionals trained uh, in selling luxury. Now, Abhay, uh, what's, what's more easy, 
getting somebody who's maybe sold uh, a non-luxury watch and teaching them to sell a luxury watch, or getting somebody who has who's never sold anything luxury and getting them to uh, sell a luxury product. What's what's easier according to you? Well, actually, in my experience, it's the attitude which matters. Whether you sold a luxury product or you're not sold a luxury product, that is not important. What is important is you have the right attitude to adopt towards the brand. Because in luxury, essentially, you're not selling a product, you're selling a brand. So the minute you start selling a brand, the product sells on its own. Vis -a -vis, in a normal case, you're selling a shirt versus a shirt versus a shirt, or, or a bag versus a bag versus a bag, uh, leave aside a Louis Vuitton. So the, the, the basic mindset of adopting a brand and selling a brand or pushing a brand is, is more important than selling a product. So the mindset really plays a, a key role there. One of the challenges that I have personally coped with uh, is when you look at uh, luxury sales associates in India and in other countries. Uh, it, it's a, uh, to my mind, somebody who's trying to sell a luxury product, an associate, uh, is a pretty difficult position, uh, simply because he's trying to sell a product to a consumer, which is probably more than you know five times his monthly salary. Uh, so imagine a person who's trying to sell a watch, which is like one and a half lakhs, and this person's salary might be maybe one and a half lakhs or two lakhs per annum. So it's really hard to get to that state uh, where you can say, well, it's not really expensive. Uh, okay. Secondly, uh, it's about product knowledge. You know, how do you develop that product knowledge when you know nobody in your family has ever seen that product? Okay. Thirdly, how do you get to a stage where you are expected to talk to that person as a wardrobe advisor or you know like an equal uh, when you know you are not an equal, right? It's uh, so. How does one? I mean, those to my mind are pretty fundamental challenges when you are trying to train talent for this industry. I mean, is that uh, does that make sense? No, you are right about that, Nilesh, but what is happening is the brands are investing towards the, the routine in terms of uh, educating them about the brands. And if you go into, uh, let's say, top-notch stores like a Tom Ford store, for example, you'll find the souls associates dressed in a Tom Ford dress. The idea is that they are experiencing the brand because they don't belong to the socioeconomic background. So the, ba the brands are investing in trying to bring up their life, their quality of life, ensuring that they experience the product so they can talk more uh, more rapidly about it. Yesterday there was a session here where, where there were, somebody was talking about uh, uh, an athlete selling a, a Nike product because he can then experience the product and he can talk properly about it. So the luxury brands have begun to to take training and, and education into a very, very serious uh, aspect. And they, do, they are beginning to invest in the, in the manpower because all the brands realize that one of the key reasons why they are failing is that lack of customer experience. And that doesn't happen because the salesperson himself doesn't understand the product. So it's a question of experiencing it yourself, then sharing it with the, with the customer. You have any sense of uh, how big the gap might be, the talent gap might be? I mean, is it really a big shortage? Uh, is it like a minor shortage? Or is it just a myth? Well, uh, as per National Skill Institute uh, research, they be, uh, the numbers projected is that we'll need some, somewhere like 1.76 million people for the luxury trade by, say, 2022. So that's a very large number if you look at it in terms of sheer size. Mind you, this covers the entire spectrum of luxury. Today, luxury is into hospitality, travel, tourism, fashion, automobile, watches, fragrances. Typically, we only look at fashion or we look at jewelry or maybe watches as, as, as luxury. But what, what happens to the travel and tourism sector, which is a large employer? What happens to the aviation sector? What happens to the automobile sector? So those are the sectors which also require, uh, they, are, they are very, very, let's say, manpower conducive. So um, uh, those numbers, those are the kind of people which are going to be required in terms of a very, very large requirement. Good. That's, that's good to know. Um, as I said, Somay, I wanted to turn back to the question on... Uh, uh, online, and I, I did want to hear about hear from everybody of how big is this opportunity really? Uh, I mean, do you have like uh, I've heard things about people from the hinterland, people from Bhopal or Jalandhar, or maybe not Jalandhar, maybe Bhopal or uh, places like that, uh, where they don't have a luxury store and no brand will actually go there for the next three four years. So, and they know what they want to buy and therefore they buy. Uh, but I also know that it's it's difficult to buy a product which you need to experience. Uh, for example, if you're trying to, I was telling somebody that if you want to buy a polo T-shirt, medium size, you know, blue color, small pony, you know, it's a straightforward order. You don't need to check. You can just click and you know it will come home. But if you're trying to buy a buy a dress, uh, which you need to try fit, and if you're trying to buy a handbag and you want to see how good it looks with your dress and is it heavy and does it have the right pockets, it's not easy to do uh, do online. So therefore, I have slightly mixed opinions about uh, this, but I'm curious to hear from the panel and please whoever has a point of view uh, it'll be curious to interesting to hear about what do you think
Without doubt, online is the next big frontier. I mean, it, it's, it's a no-brainer. We, we made a conscious decision from 2015 onwards, we'll stop adding stores that aggressively as we're doing as, as right, right now, and we'll start rolling out e-commerce sites. Having said that, we, we're launching our e-commerce site uh, soon. Uh, the, we understand that the Indian consumer still wants the touch, the feel, the fit, the experience. They do not want to just buy it from the screen unless it is discounted or there's a special offer and all of those freebies thrown in. So, but we don't do that. We, we sell full price. So how do we do that? Uh, we've, done, we've, done, we've, we've done something which is unique in its area. Uh, we, in the metros, what we do is that we give a client a, a special facility. We tell her to browse through, the, through our site as she would browse through our store. And typically when she's browsing a store, she may, a human mind will like 10, 12, 15 outfits. She may try five, six, she may buy two, three. That's a normal pattern. We tell her, do the same thing here. You select up to 10 to 15 outfits, 20 outfits, whatever you can. In 24 hours, a van carrying them with the tailor, alteration tailor sitting inside the van, comes to her place at her time. And she's not yet paid for it. Okay? She checks she has the touch, the feel, the try. She goes through the whole thing and ultimately if she likes something, she pays for it. If she doesn't like something, perfectly fine. We still give her a box of chocolates because she's allowed the van with our branding to come inside and advertise in her, in, in her loca locality. So this is what we are launching right away. Uh, in fact, the, the Bombay and Delhi pilot projects are ready. They'll be launched in the next couple of days. Uh, we, we want to we want to diminish the barrier between the brick and the click. And it's a moral responsibility to push our clients towards the click. Fantastic. It looks like a brilliant idea to me. I'm sure uh, many women sitting here uh, will take hold of this opportunity. Uh, Manishi, you, you worked in Watch and Jewelry earlier. Uh, what's your take on this? The non-store retail, so to say. I mean, I, uh, I mean, okay, there are two elements of non-store retail. One is uh, the home. Uh, visit kind of a part which is uh, fabulously strong on uh, watch and jewelry also uh, but I would place it somewhere different from a classical internet model internet per se is extremely functional uh, in most of the luxury sales the value which you get from the product uh, is not only when you use it you get a lot of value when you are doing the purchase yeah. so the entire experience on going to the store uh, acting a bit snobbish having a juice out there uh, paying through your card moving out of the store with a louis vuitton bag uh, all these are critical part of the satisfaction process which you get from the product uh, if you do it on the web you lose out uh, a large part of that chain unless you get a discounted value uh, then it's a different ball game. A home visit is interesting because uh, it adds to importance. I mean, it, it somewhere says, you know, I am such a good customer for Kimaya that they send me 25 uh, suits and a tailor. Uh, so it, it, it brings in its own value. It will work, can definitely work because it's a bragging uh, thing to tell your friend that, you know, I have to go back home at 4 o'clock because they are sending uh, 25 suits for me to try so that could definitely work uh, but a cold buy on an internet unless it is not discounted i would have my doubts especially for categories uh, wherein uh, uh, which are experiential in nature i mean a luxury travel can still work because yeah. uh, the travel is what you are experiencing not you the can't purchase. experience the travel yeah right so uh, not the purchase it could still uh, it could still work in my opinion yeah so can I, you yeah sure okay but well, I did a research in terms of what is really lacking in terms of the luxury manpower space and what really emerged there was that there is a new category of buyer which is emerging in luxury. It's called a boutique shy buyer. Who's this buyer? He's a buyer who's non-sophisticated, doesn't speak English, but he's got pots of money. It comes from the A.D. Gurney report that the pots of money is lying with the tier 2, tier 3 city or the new money. He's the one who's probably saved all his life, sent his children to study abroad, and they, they speak very good English. They're influencing the buying decisions. But this gentleman or gentlewoman doesn't want to walk into Emporio because first the aura of the gate man at the Emporio, the five-star environment over there, then the aura of the, of the nice boutique over there, and then the snooty behavior by a brand-dressed kid standing there and trying to sell luxury. So this customer is turning into a boutique-shy customer. He wants to buy online. 
His children are advising him what he needs to buy and how he needs to buy. He trusts his children because he's educated them very well. They understand all about the brands. They tell him, Papa, you need to be wearing this because we want you to be dressed well in front of our friends. So that's the new customer which is turning up in large numbers and he is buying on the net. Mind you, even in terms of luxury, he's buying on the net. So th that's one new category which I have observed. Fantastic. I mean, that, that's very, very interesting. Uh, and I guess I, what I liked about Pradeep's model was, you know, instead of you're trying to carry a bag, uh, from the store, the van is coming to you. So the whole brand is coming to your. Uh, interesting, very good. Um, <clears throat> Sukhan, you are trying to say something. You know, I agree with what uh, my colleagues here are saying. I think um, it's a no-brainer. It has to impact your business and retail. And also, there are ways to integrate the regular traditional brick and mortar and online and benefit and get your efficiency in your brick and mortar higher. We are doing something similar what Pradeep was sharing. We have an online catalog built into the boutiques. So if you're gifting, you come into the store, you see what you like, but the because it's a gift, you can make sure that you just order it online from the boutique itself, it gets sent. We also carry a much higher catalog on the online application versus the store, which helps us plan our stock efficiency much higher. The SKUs, which are slow sellers, are on the online catalog versus as physical stocks in the boutique. So it's a nice integration across models to basically give a better consumer experience because I do agree for premium and aspirational products, you need certain amount of touch and feel trying it out, though there's a lot of technology which is helping us even overcome that in terms of touching and making sure you get a feel. Uh, but till now it's a good mix and match to make sure we leverage on the, the um, benefits of online, which is the flexibility as uh, everybody was saying, to make sure it gets in, as well as the experience of getting into the boutique. So great future for both across. Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure all of you ladies and gentlemen have uh, have some questions that you'd like to ask the panel. So if there are any questions, we're happy to take. I'm from the brand Baggett and uh, I feel uh, a kind of product is doing very well, uh, but it's very value for money clients. I would like to expand it to the customers who are looking out for more premium stuff, but I feel we are already in that, you know, bag it is for, like you'd go into the train and you'd see a million women carrying the brand, but you'd not see it in, you know, HEPA girls carrying it. So how do we get there? You want to make your brand yeah. appeal to the next higher level of... Yeah, so I don't think, uh, you know, if you go any higher, we'll touch the Zara's and that kind of price bracket where they would prefer to buy an international brand than not an Indian brand for the same amount of money. So I, I will, I will, I think Pradeep I will, I will, Pradeep, before you kind of answer that question, I, I have a slight counter question for you. In India, the, the shape of the pyramid is like this. The lower you go, the bigger market you get, okay? Uh, you wanting to go higher. It's not yet proven that brands in the higher space are necessarily making more money. Um, so if you want to do that, you're most welcome. Uh, but be conscious that you will be vacating a slightly more, a larger market space if you do that. Pradeep. <clears throat> Completely agree with Dilesh. Yes, of course. Uh, the numbers will taper as you go up. But I, know, uh, yeah, I, I aspire to be like top shop in Oxford Street. If you've seen there, it's, it's, you know, it's right opposite. And uh, they have bags for the college girl as well as you know bags for the higher leather kind looking, which are more premiumly priced. It's very difficult to change a brand perception, the brand chromosome, as we call it. I would suggest a better option would be, you have the expertise, the back-end, the infrastructure, you, you, you created one baguette, you need to create another brand name, which is premium. Instead of trying to take it up and confusing the customer, let that remain. Don't touch an existing cash cow. Let that remain. You don't have the money to finance and market two brands. You don't, you don't need too much money to make, to make the product and make, the, make the, uh, lo the logistics and the distribution. That is already in place. All you need to do is just create another brand. You could, you could, in your own store, you could create a special premium area which sells that brand. So you don't have to spend too much money into it. But call it something else. You, you can't, uh, how much ever you glorify uh, a particular brand, you can't, it's very difficult to take it up. It's very easy to take it down. You, it's very, very difficult to defy gra gravity. This does call for uh, a deeper introspection. I suggest you catch uh, Pradeep after, after this separately. The gentleman here, you had a question. 
but tell me how profitable it is you know to the cost which is there is it limited to an area okay the service which you are offering and and how profitable is it to your company tell me the cost a it is it is uh, only metro specific so we are only doing it in bombay delhi first and we'll do it in the other two metros later so right now it's bombay delhi okay what do i have to do do i have to spend 1 rupee on merchandise on stocks no i'm pulling into my existing stocks the only thing that i have to do is the cost is a van and some diesel i know diesel prices are going up <laughs> but <laughs> but that's it that's it what what do what, manpower is, is tapped from the store the stock is from the from the stocks that i hold i don't have to spend anything and look at how much how much uh, how many times uh, i mean what can i offer to the client what i can offer to the client is not just a product it's an ego massage that the cost of doing that is huge and what has been the response actually are you seeing okay we done trial runs fabulous fantastic we've not yet advertised okay we launch, launching it in december november in december full fledged it. uh it's it's come on keep yourself be be put yourself in the client's shoes you're a traveler you're on transit you're a working man you are you know you have compulsions you want your family members also to see what you're buying you don't have a traffic issue it it's raining in bombay it's hot in delhi i can't travel my my guests are coming tonight for dinner you have all those compulsions here yeah, you call them at 2 o'clock in i mean in the afternoon or 12 o'clock in the night it's 24 hours 7 o'clock in the morning you want the van comes yeah i'm sure it's a great concept which you like the, the true luxury is to have time and most luxury consumers they don't have time so they do have money uh, and they but they don't have time they don't have they don't want to take the headache of uh, kind of going browsing shopping is painful uh, okay it's not always enjoyable so it is an in india india one of the advantages that we have is the service that we are able to provide if you add that with the luxury product you can make the experience truly fantastic uh, globally luxury brands provide service but that service comes at a pretty expensive uh, cost my question is to the panel i two questions i would like to uh, put on to the panel one is uh, can you tell me some of the typical characteristics or maybe the traits of a consumer or a luxury consumer when he uh, when he is actually making a purchase that is one thing secondly if a luxury consumer uh, would prefer to buy a luxury product from a multi brand boutique or will 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 he be more interested in buying it from a, a single brand boutique maybe okay so uh, maybe i'll uh, manish you want to take the question i mean okay single brand and multi brand uh, is uh, uh, probably a bit industry specific and in terms of stage of life of brand uh, but for like all individuals i would want to get Uh, a choice uh, which is strong enough in front of me uh, so in an ideal situation i would want 15 single brand boutiques each having enough depth of assortment uh, and therefore the concept of a of a luxury mall uh, or a palladium kind of a place or an emporio kind of a place would work in an ideal scenario however because there are retail issues because costs are high and therefore uh, a multi brand kind of a concept uh, would evolve out of that Uh, but as a customer i think everybody would prefer to have uh, a nice assortment uh, that is on the first part and on the second part like i previously also said that the in terms of uh, uh, the mindset i think a lot of people have some understanding of the brand so when they walk into a store they expect you to tell them more uh, a they expect you to tell them why why this brand is what it is uh, why should a product be so expensive uh, plus there are uh, functional things like i mean emotional things like Uh, he should feel happy he should feel uh, being massaged he should feel uh, being taken care of uh, and the third part is that if there is an after sales issue uh, or a quality issue then it falls apart i mean so yes he is willing to pay you a premium for a price uh, but he wants uh, top notch quality on that kind of thing uh, see my i i since being into retail myself my experience is uh, india has got or maybe any city has got a very niche client of luxury uh, buyer i mean i uh, product buyers and uh, we have also seen that when a consumer is actually buying a product 
maybe he has not come for to buy a luxury product but and it is very difficult in india to understand who has actually got how much money so you see that the consumer may be looking at a product and end up into buying maybe a very uh, uh, high priced item so in this kind of a scenario maybe uh, you know the multi multi brand uh, uh, store where they are stocking maybe items from 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 a various price point and various brand works out to be better or because anyway he is not very much aware about the brand he is no he is not aware about the price point it is more of an aspiration which builds up when he is actually selecting a product and then suddenly he is actually going into buying into luxury so let let me address that you are right <clears throat> uh, what a multi brand outlet does it, it it caters to a variety seeker so there is a variety seeker who wants to see all brands together because he or she is not aware they want to see everything before they buy so multi brand outlet caters to that kind of an audience an exclusive brand outlet ebo typically caters to an outlet uh, for a consumer who has at least bought into the brand a little bit so he knows he or she knows there's a brand therefore they go in from a brand point of view an ebo allows you to offer a depth uh, sorry a breadth as well as depth as well as an experience which is difficult to offer in an ebo so a brand will always want to make the choice uh, you get too much exposure in mbo the brand sometimes feels that they are losing their identity so they want you know balance between mbo in a market like india you are right uh, my personal opinion is also we need to have more mbos across categories so you need a for example in personal care uh, an mbo like sephora would make immense sense where you have a wide variety of brands available at one at one place uh, an mbo like the collective makes sense for menswear so there is a need Uh, for that to appeal to the variety seeker and then uh, some of them will migrate uh, into you know brand seekers and then they'll go into the ebos i saw some somebody wanted to have a question on that side yes madam uh, you had expansion plans uh, you spoke about uh, the fact that you have expansion plans till 2015 and getting into e-commerce uh, uh, you know my question is how difficult is it for you to find the right talent in the market to work with you i'm not talking about people who are front ending your store or just your store managers but the leadership team that works with you to you know run this company and expand it to a very large scale so do you find it difficult to find the right talent in the market uh, people with the right attitude that's also been mentioned before uh, you know because indians also look at the value you know when they're spending 100 dollars on an outfit you know so is that has that been a challenge for you as an as a uh, you know since you're running the organization and expanding it so i completely agree with you yes that challenge remains but then what came first the chicken or the egg you make your goal post and you work towards it you find like minded people you train them you you do your proper orientations and ultimately it all falls into place if you decided that this is this is the goal post and you have to hit the goal inside at any cost you'll find a way so yes it is not so easy because it's 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 a new area it's a new arena obviously uh, set there are no set benchmarks so uh, it's part of the journey manish i i like you to respond to this as well um how is your difficult has it has it been for dfs or or lvmh i i think i would largely agree with pradeep and to my mind uh, the front end is a more difficult part because there are complexities that they have to look behave and relate to the customer in front of you uh, but if you look at back end and the leadership part of it it's 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 not so much sector specific it's not so much luxury specific i mean Uh, a good manager who has a good sense of the ground who understands and uh, you know the basic model by which you solve a business problem uh, to my mind is very much similar in a fmcg environment or in a retail environment or in a luxury environment uh, so fundamentally uh, there is a bigger challenge which is on the on the front end and lesser challenge on the uh, back end part of it because uh, i i would believe a good manager from any background fits in i mean it it probably takes time Uh, maybe 3 months 6 months or 12 months or whatever it takes uh, to train him on the specifics of your industry uh, but it's doable it's 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 not so much of an issue for me i i'll throw i'll throw it to abhay but before that let me just tell you that there are more number of i i get a, a fair number of people reaching out to me uh, saying i want to you know work in the luxury industry and i want many of them come with very specific brands saying i want to work with jimmy choo and somebody saying i want to work with only dior and so there seems to be the industry has a lot of aspirational appeal a whole bunch of people wanting to work in the industry uh, and i'm sure they will be willing to work even if you paid them half of what fmcg 
uh, would pay them. But I'd, I'd like Abhay to respond to that in terms of the attraction of the industry uh, versus the economics or the value proposition that the industry has to new employees. Over 600 respondents. One of the categories for the respondents were brand owners, where the brands could have either come into India or are waiting for certain, let's say, strategic lenses. So the question thrown to them was that, what happens to my operations guy? What does he do after he's opened three Gucci stores? He just remains operations head. Where does he move in the value chain? Does he ever become a brand manager? So the answer to that question was that, well, he needs to qualify in luxury brand management. But there's no luxury school in India which is offering that program. So what do we do? So um, as a company, Luxury Connect has taken that challenge and we brought SDA Bakuni to India and we're conducting luxury brand management programs. The second challenge is the front end, which is customer experience. Now, no school in the world teaches luxury customer experience. It is an inborn talent. And as uh, Pradeep said, every company has to decide its own formula, its own track in terms of how do you want to train the front end staff. But the survey went deeper into finding out with category four, which are the brand owners, and category one, people like me controlling luxury in India. What do we do for the training? So which brand is perceived to give the best customer experience? What threw up worldwide is Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton is perceived to give the best customer experience. So Luxury Connect tied up with the training director of Louis Vuitton to come and conduct these programs in India. So the last six months, we conducted three programs already. And today we have, I mean, likes of a Tommy Hilfiger or Marks and Spencer wanting to raise their service standards to a luxury brand against a Ferrari or maybe even a Zoya or maybe even a Taj Hospitality, which is participating in these programs. I have now been invited by Mahindra tomorrow to conduct a special program for the 200 dealers. So the fact remains that there is no uh, excuse for training. There has to be the mindset by the promoters to invest on training. And as Pradeep said, the goal has already been set. And this is just a minor challenge which needs to be met. Okay, uh, great. I think we have run out of time. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll get a reminder from the organizers uh, to wind up the session. Uh, anybody there who can tell me whether we have more time or should we wind down? Okay, great. So, uh, thank you very much. I'm sure all of you have more questions. The panel is going to be around uh, for you to talk individually and clarify your questions and doubts. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.